Um, some of you know me from Master Gardeners and wandered around here at the extension. Some of you may have ran into me out in South Branch Nursery if you've ever been over there. Uh, I've been with the Master Gardener Association for five years now. Uh, this spring actually marks uh, the fifth year since my graduation from the class. In that time, I've taught quite a number of classes. I've answered a ton of questions, and I've learned pretty much one new thing every day or two, which is always one of the things I want to go for. Uh, growing up, you need a little bit more back background on me. I learned most of my gardening from my grandparents. My grandfather taught me everything he knew about vegetables. My grandmother taught me everything I knew about flowers. And keeping them out of each other's respective beds taught me what I needed to know about the clumsy. <laughs> uh, my grandfather was great at growing anything you could eat, except for asparagus. He's the only man I've ever known who couldn't grow a cedar tree outside of the fence room. So today we're talking about native plants in the home garden. There are a ton of native plants in Tennessee. There's more than I can feasibly cover in even an hour long or even two or three hours time span. To give you an idea, this is one of the more prolific guys they've got on Tennessee and uh, something in the southeast native plants. There's about three to four different plants per page of this book. So there's quite the number of them. Uh, if you like this guy, I've got it up here for you to look at after we get done. You can find copies of it practically anywhere. I recommend if you want to purchase one, stop it out by the, either the battlefield or the wilderness station over at Barfield, because those proceeds go to help everyone here locally, and then the battlefield goes to help keep up the battlefield and keep all the invasive plants out of it. So, like I said, Tennessee has a ton of different native plants. This is just a quick smattering of some of the prettier ones, and here we've got a couple of trees and shrubs. Big leaf magnolia down here in the corner. We've got bottle brush buckeye right there. We have a plant that is very common at my mother-in-law's place near all the cedar. That's Indian pink up here in the top left. It's a plant that gets about yay tall. Sometimes we'll reach on up about here. You got a beautiful, beautiful flower on the top of it that's red and yellow on the inside. Very upright, very nice form to it. One of my favorite vines right here is cross vine. This guy is semi-evergreen to evergreen. So if you need a permanent screen cover and you don't want to have to pull with keep an English ivy pull off of everything and its cousin, go with the cross vine. Richard? Yes, ma'am. There's a beautiful standard cross sign out here at the corner of the ag center. Yep. In the back. I, I didn't know about that one. The only <coughs> one I knew about was the one we got on the side of the shed over here, which has finally started taking the off after a couple of years. Down there. It's a gorgeous <coughs> plant. Yeah. Well, it's a shame more people don't plant it in places. Does it grow up in the shade? It grows yeah. pretty all right in the shade. It gets a little thin sometimes. In the sun, it'll get a lot thicker. It does no problems whatsoever climbing to where you, where you need it to climb to. It grows quite quickly. It just doesn't break things and dig into stuff the way uh, wisteria and ivy does. It'll just kind of run over and around and pass stuff. Can you maintain its height if you don't want it to get 30 feet? Yeah, oh yeah, you can go in there and you can just kind of tip and top it back wherever it starts running out. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is just keep an eye on it and just keep turning it back in on itself. Yeah. And that lets it get really nice and thick. I recommend it a ton for people who are doing arbors and pergolas over decks because they want something that's going to give them lots of good shade cover underneath there and be kind of pretty. Great plant for that. A 20 by 20 area, two of those guys will have it covered in less than three years. And hummingbirds love it. They absolutely adore cross vine. And I have to share this. The reason why it's called cross vine if you take and you cut across one of the vines and you look at the center, the pith of it, it makes a little cross. That's where the name comes from. Um, so now that I, yes ma'am. Does it bloom a specific time or does it, is it long bloom? It's a, it's so a, I call a sporadic repeat bloomer. It does a really big push in the spring and then it'll come on again a little at a time throughout the rest of the summer but it'll never bloom again after that first big run as it 
heavily as it did then. Um, native plants are plants that have evolved over geologic time to suit our area. They're stuff that has been here for longer than we have. They've gotten used to our soil, such as it is. They've gotten used to the temperature swings that we always have. They've gotten used to our drought and our wet. They take all the conditions that we can throw at them and they are very well adapted to it. They're also generally defined as anything that existed in our area prior to Europeans getting here. Because there's a lot of plants that we know are from other places in the world that wound up here before we did. And there's some stuff since we've introduced so many new things that we can't honestly tell what got here when and from where. Um, everyone's familiar with thistle that grows out in the fence rows and everything. There's one smaller non-purple one that's native to Tennessee and most of the southeast. Then the big tall purple one's from England. And those guys go everywhere. It's really hard to just separate what's in there and out there. Uh, one of the things that makes the wildflower book that I showed you earlier really useful is that it gives you the a pretty good rundown of where stuff came from and when it may have been introduced and how long it's been here. Another common plant that we all think of as native in Tennessee that actually isn't is that white yellow honeysuckle. That is Japanese honeysuckle. <clears throat> that stuff is incredibly invasive. It's so prolific. It's been here so long that most people think it belongs here. Uh, our native honeysuckles come in two colors and pretty much two colors only, and that's red and flat yellow. And I actually learned about just the straight yellow honeysuckle today. I have a list I've been staring at for three years, and I've never noticed it on there till this morning. So, new thing every day. So why should you care about native plants? Besides them being really, really awesome to look at and improving our own unique biodiversity here in Tennessee, there's over 565 endangered native plant species in Tennessee. Some of them are just threatened, some of them are near extinction, some of them blessedly just recently came off the list a couple years ago, like Tennessee coneflower. It finally got pulled off of the endangered list. So it's making a comeback. It's making a comeback partially due to the fact that one of the best ways to maintain native plant supplies is for us to start planting them and repopulating places with them as they become available to us. Because if it's useful to a person, very rarely does it ever go anywhere but up. No cows are going extinct anytime soon. Um, habitat, habitat loss and the introduction of other numerous exotic and invasive plant species is where all these guys are going. They're out competing their spaces. That Japanese honeysuckle, it takes over room to cross vine, the coral honeysuckle, the yellow, yellow honeysuckle, our passion vines, our pipe vine would have normally grown in. Some of our nicer, friendlier undergrowth shrubs that we normally have growing here, like our native euonymus, the strawberry bush, our osmanthus that we have here, our native hollies get run out by a uh, little leaf privet that's gone wild and you've seen hedgerows or anywhere where there's light. If you've been driving down the interstate or any of the highways around here, you've seen it flowering all over the place underneath the trees. Yeah, right now it's doing its thing, it smells nice, it makes a good bush, it holds soil back, which is why it originally got planted, but it takes over everything. Without proper awareness, advocacy, and use of native plants <laughs> by us home gardeners, many of our native species will be extinct or extinct in the future. Tennessee coneflower is an excellent example. People liked it, they wanted it, they started cultivating it. They started planting it back out in their yards, in the fields, cedar glades that were on their property, and now it started making a comeback strong enough that it's been pulled off the list. The more we're aware of what their native plants are, where they do their best at, how to work them in, the better we can help make sure that they stay around and they stay strong. Because in Tennessee, we have a wonderful amount of biodiversity here. Because we're a very long state. We cover many, many different climates and soil types and different alpine levels. We have mountains in the east. We have prairies in the west. We have 
cedar glades, which you only find in really in middle Tennessee. Most of the species in those in cedar glades you will find nowhere else. Are there sparse populations that loosely resemble stuff you'll find way out west? Well, what is the cedar glade? Cedar glades. Uh, I've got a slide in here, but I'll touch on them real quick. The short definition is a cedar glade is a big limestone flat with some shallow soil put in through there where the primary tree that you find in and around it is eastern red cedar, Juniperus virginiana. Um, side note on native plants, if you don't know your Latin, if you really get into it, you will start learning your Latin because it is the only way to be sure of what you're getting. Um, they'll also find some elms, some other little small trees and shrubs, lots of small wildflowers and other things. The area is usually, besides being marked by limestone and cedar, it floods seasonally, it dries out super hard seasonally. Tennessee's native prickly pear, you'll find it frequently in cedar glades. Yeah, if you didn't know we had a cactus that actually lived here, we have a cactus that actually lives here. Um, the benefits of did you have any other? No, that's good. Thank you. Uh, benefits of landscaping with natives. <clears throat> Wonderful little native side garden right here. Naturally adapted to withstand Tennessee. We kill everything, or at least we try to. As I tell folks, we'll grow everything you want to in a year, you kill half of it. These plants, they have evolved to survive here. They're thick and thin, and if they can't survive, they can produce enough seed and enough root mass to make it to the next year when they can. They're used to our diseases. Stuff that's native to Tennessee that kills other things out, they're used to it. Cicadas came through a few years ago. Lots of non-native trees got really badly damaged. And the native stuff usually grows fast enough that it doesn't bother them. The stuff that is smaller, that plants usually have hard enough wood, the cicadas don't bother to take and lay the eggs in the branches. They're really, really used to them. Uh, most of our native pests bother the living daylights out of our cultivated crops and flowers. They don't bother the native stuff. The more native plants you have in your yard, the lower your pest insect populations are going to be. Because they're not going to have all that extraneous food source that's weakened or they're just more used to or more easy to predate on that they can just then move on to the rest of your stuff. Extremely low maintenance. Uh, this is one of those caveat things. They're really low maintenance once you get them in and get them established. Um, our soil is a very hard soil, it is a very tough soil. If you get something that's been cultivated inside of the container, it's been used to growing in very loose, very nice, very friendly ground. Um, I always recommend to folks if you're doing perennial beds, amend the entire bed area and then start putting your plants in. It works wonders. Otherwise, plant stuff up so it can drain better, make sure everything is mulched really well, make sure you're doing infrequent, very deep soaking watering because you always want your water to go into the ground very, very slowly so it seeps very, very deeply. Plant roots then chase that water and they get established more heavily and heartily. But once you got all that said and done, these plants, if they've got those good conditions to begin with, they go ballistic and they take off and they just start running. Uh, drought tolerant, most of the ones that are drought tolerant, that are supposed to be drought tolerant, are super drought tolerant. Always with plants, you're talking right plant, right place. You do not want to take a coral bell, which is a wonderful little forest wildflower, and put it in the middle of the cedar glade field. It will die, period. There is nothing you can do besides throwing a shade cloth over the top of it to keep that poor thing alive. It's just going to get too hot and it's just going to get too dry. So while these plants are tough, they're tough to their evolved locations. So always make sure you're matching that stuff together. <coughs> Less dependency on traditional pesticides. Circle them back up at the top. Lots of circles, if you know what I mean. Because they don't have the pest issues, because they're not going to be predated on by bugs and disease as often, you don't have to spray them or treat them for bugs as often. Only time you're really going to have to worry about stuff is when things get introduced. 
our native dogwoods, Cornish, Florida, currently being very heavily affected by dogwood and prachnos. It is a pretty substantial long-term death for the tree. They'll just keep kind of following it up the branches and it'll eventually kill off every leaf, flower, branch, and then the entire tree itself. For that, you do have to make sure you're watching for those kinds of things on trees that you know are susceptible. If you're buying new plants, get cultivars that are selected to be hardy for that. Uh, for dogwoods, we're usually talking things like the Appalachian Spring Series. Uh, most of those plants are selected for better disease hardiness, especially against dogwood and thracnos. Almost anything that Don Shadow's grown out over at Shadow Nursery, he's got uh, those cultivars because they are extremely tolerant to the diseases that are coming online. It's even starting to affect our wild populations and knocking them back. There's estimates that within a few decades there may be a very small portion of old growth dogwoods, if any, in the wild. How do you recognize that your dogwood might have Um, Anthracnose, there's a bunch of different kinds of it, so sometimes it's really hard to pinpoint what it is and which one it is without getting underneath the microscope where it really starts looking different. But the signs are going to be discolored uh, reddish spots with rings on them on the leaves. You'll usually notice it first in the spring with that kind of coloration on the petals where the tips will take and be a redder color than the rest of it is supposed to be, especially if it's like a white dogwood. Um, sometimes you'll notice striations in the bark underneath in that uh, heart in that uh, green wood under the bark where you have little brown stripes running through there where it's kind of started creeping through. Uh, the leaves make it really easy because the tips will have some of that on there and you have little spots and splotches going along the leaves. If you've ever seen that red and black uh, spotting that you get on hydrangeas, it's really similar in color and texture. It'll make the leaf feel crinkly whenever it's dry outside. If you think you happen to have it on your dogwood, uh, it's one of those things it's best to take a sample up here to the extension and get them to take a look at it because there's some stuff you can use to treat the tree and kind of at least keep it under control. There's some mechanical things where you can take an attempt to prune it out. Uh, there's also cultural things where you make sure you're not having a lot of water splash back on the trees or moving around, bird will take and keep moving around. I had a friend who had a bird bath right underneath the tree, a dogwood. And I could see where there was some version of anthracnose starting to climb the tree. That, and that was two years ago. She moved the bird bath out from underneath the tree so that water splash was further away. It hasn't moved up the tree anymore. So it's just a matter of doing that kind of stuff and it'll help control and mitigate it some. Maintain biodiversity. Um, you'll hear this a lot from me and other people that talk about uh, various native plants and just your gardens. The more varied your yard, the more varied the forests, the healthier and hardier they are. And that biodiversity gives resilience to the native to the plant populations. It reduces the ability for disease to quickly spread through. Uh, anyone here remember Dutch elm disease or read about it? The um, reason Dutch elm disease was such a problem is, is that everyone and their cousin in the United States loved elm trees. Beautiful trees, absolutely gorgeous trees for putting down boulevards and roadways. And then a beetle arrived with a little fungus or bacteria, I can't remember which right now, and started spreading from tree to tree to tree. Now, whenever you have 500 trees spread down one side of a mile of road, it makes it really easy for those bugs to find their next host and then move the disease on to those. So making sure you're being very picky about how much of what you put in the yard making sure you have as many very different plants as you can in there is really important to increasing the resilience of your garden and of our woodlands and prairies and creek sides you have to make sure you've got a lot of different stuff going on it even works out really well for you in the end because it is much better to have a long border of six or seven different types of evergreens to block out the neighbors than it is to plant one long row of about 50 Leland Cypress and then watch our summers and our soil start killing them out here and there. And you're going, 
I got these giant holes in my fence now. What am I going to do? And at that point, I recommend you just start putting in green giant arborvitae and hollies and other evergreen shrubs to fill in those places because they're going to be tougher. There's going to be different ones. Then it's also going to, if something dies, you're not going to notice it and have just sticking out right in front of you. Whereas if you've got five Lelands, dead spot, dead spot, seven Lelands. I see it all the time and it's a very sad thing. Monocultures. Oh, this is a really, really fun one now. Knockout roses. Who here has seen Rose Rosette? If you haven't seen Rose Rosette, it is a fun disease. And by fun, I mean the kind of fun you tell your kids you're about to have whenever you go to the dentist. It's a virus transmitted by mites. They're currently checking to make sure that we transmit it by blades from pruning that whenever the virus gets into the new rose material, and it hits all roses, just we got a lot of knockouts to help spread it. <clears throat> it starts the plant doing what's known as witch's broom, where it'll send out lots and lots of growth that's usually deformed in one concentrated place. That growth has little ability to really process sunlight and sugars because the leaf surface is smaller, it's twisted, it rarely goes to green. It stays that young red color a lot of times. <laughs> and then the plant just starts getting nasty because it'll put thorns over every single square inch of a branch after a while. You can't even get your fingers in on there to hold it because there's so many thorns. And by that point, you have two options. You can either attempt to cut out the infected branch and pray it hasn't gotten into the rest of the shrub which it probably has. Or usually what I tell folks is you have to pull up the ropes. That's not so bad on a knockout where you can go and find another one and replace it if you really want to, or wait a year or two to see if it's spread around and the rosettes spread around and put some back in. It's a really crying shame to be its own great grandma's ropes. So you have to really watch carefully for that. About the only ways to really keep it down is make sure there aren't any infected roses in your area and I'm talking 300 yards to a mile away at least because those little mites travel in the wind, something fierce. Um, in the spring when you're doing your pruning, prune the track plants back uh, as hard as you can t tolerate and then some. Spray them down with the dormant oil and over the course of the season, you want to put down stuff that is going to keep the mites from landing. So you don't need contact pesticides like seven dust we need things like neem oil and pyrethrin, which are going to keep those bugs from even thinking about laying on the plants a lot of the time. So that it's got enough of a scent to it and enough of an effect, even just being present, it'll deter the bugs. Name those, what you spray on it. Uh, neem oil or pyrethrin tends to be the two most common things you can get a hold of, but anything that's gonna act more as a repellent and less of a just a straight contact insecticide. Because once they've bit the plant, they've done the damage, they have probably already spread the disease. So putting things on them like mid corporate, the systemic insecticides, doesn't do any good other than to kill the mite population off of the infected plant. And that doesn't help you keep it from going to the other plants. I've known people now have had to pull 20, 30, 50 roses out of yards. If anyone's ever been to Bennett's Nursery several years ago, his row front was covered in knockouts. Rosette came through, killed every, started infecting every single one, started killing them off. He had to pull them all out. Positive note on that point though, he went back in and put in lime white and Annabelle hydrangeas, <coughs> which is awesome because lime white and Annabelle hydrangeas are native plants. Beneficial to native pollinators and backyard wildlife. Native plants feed native creatures. They encourage them to come visit and you get to see them. We have a beautiful number of native birds that we put in plenty of native plants. We get to attract all kinds of them. <clears throat> we have a wonderful variety of every other kind of native critter you may or may not want. So we've got a good number of different amphibians. We've got a few reptiles. We've got some mammals. Sometimes you don't want the rabbits in your yard, but hey, if you've got something for them to eat on besides your lettuce, they might go to. Our home, the Central Basin. So I mentioned this earlier about Tennessee being a really big, long state. 
They've got mountains, Valley Ridge province, where there's lots of hollers and whatnot for stuff to hide in. Got the Highland Rim. But we live right here in this little area known as the Central Basin. There's lots of really fun here. Um, we have cedar, cedar deciduous forests and cedar glades. They're all covered by thin layers of soil usually, uh, exposed rock. Uh, tremendous amount of biodiversity in the cedar glades. I already talked about those. Many endemic species, that term means stuff that is supposed to be there, stuff that is native and has evolved there. Uh, Highland Rim consists of temperate forest, mostly of oaks and hickory. Um, that's why it's called oak hickory forest, but you're also going to find tulip poplars, different types of maple, uh, several of our native magnolias, all sorts of different things. Um, these forests are remarkably diverse in their populations because of the way the state is. There's some stuff in Tennessee that you don't find anywhere else anymore, especially once you get over into the Smokies. And the more familiar you are with what lives where in Tennessee, the more easy it makes it for you to figure out where to put it in your yard and how to plant it. Uh, rhododendrons and azaleas are one of my favorites. People try to plant them even level around here. You don't want to plant them even with clay soil. You have to plant them up. Get them out of the ground some. Build some good soil up and around them so they drain really well. They're used to living here. So they're used to living in soil that's anywhere from this deep to this deep and then sitting on a flat sheet of rock. So they don't want to be sitting in water. They want that ground to get flush with moisture, then suck it out of there. Whatever's left gets to move on. They also like really acidic stuff because in those areas you have lots of plant material falling down, lots of leaves building up, putting down tannic acids and keeping that soil really acidic. So you have to make sure you keep that same kind of environment going for them in the ground. Gardening gets really, really interdisciplinary after a while. Cedar glades, nice picture of a cedar glade. I already talked about those some. You can see the flat limestone rock right here. Bunch of little wildflowers mixed in. De facto cedar trees. Red cedar will grow practically anywhere it can get a foothold. Um, elms and other uh, real hardy trees that don't mind growing in rock or they can find their ways around and through it. Much like the cedar trees. Oak hickory forest. If you've been walking through the woods around here, been out the Farfield Park, you've seen our, our forests. Uh, they're not always something to look at once you get in the middle of the summer. Most of the flowering plants in there come up just in the spring. I'll get to what they're called here in a second. Prairie, we have lots of adjunct prairie species, plants that you don't always find out past the Mississippi because we have had several intrusions through geologic history of prairie-like conditions here in Middle Tennessee. And we even used to have bison here, so. So why don't people use native landscape plants? I've been, I've been talking about this for a while now. Why is no one else doing it? A few reasons, in a lot of cases, it has to do with perception. Uh, Non-native plant, native plants can look weedy. They're thin, they're straggly. They look like something your grandma may have pulled out of her yard or your grandfather constantly kept out of the garden. Non-natives are often beneficial to people's needs. I mean, there's lots of native, uh, the, lots of herb plants that we put out that they tend to go crazy, mints one of them. They taste good, we use them in cooking, we use them for medicine they can take over an area and run other populations out. Sometimes there isn't a native to suit your need. If you're needing something that's going to survive no matter what in the middle of a parking lot with about two foot of soil, it's hard to find a native tree that's gonna do that, especially in full sun. So they're gonna wind up going to things like Zelcova that can take really hard, compacted, shallow soil and lots and lots of air pollution. Not as much development of cultivars. We're slowly starting to get more varied types of plants. It's like purple coneflower has easily 15, 20 or more different varieties of purple coneflower. Tennessee coneflower, you've got Tennessee coneflower. That's it. Um, 
more common one that people do get more cultivation as time goes on is Baptisia, Blue False Indigo. There's several different cultivars of it now. So increased demand on plant once will get people to start making more cultivars. More cultivars means more cultivation and more growing. And the more of that that you have, the more of those native species will wind up with. Differences in the way you grow natives in standard landscape plants. Some people cannot get it out of their head that you don't have to spray it down with seven dust every seven days to keep the plants healthy. They want to be able to do that. If they're not doing that or not having to do that, sometimes in their mind there's something wrong. There is nothing wrong with not having to spray your plants. I recommend that you always go mechanical first anyway, so get out there, pick the bugs, and squash them. If you don't want to do that, pay the neighbor kids to get out there and pick the bugs and squash them. <laughs> um, some, a lot of landscape plants, they can be a lot more drought tolerant usually. Some of them have super vigorous root systems that go absolutely nuts as soon as they touch the soil. <coughs> so they settle in faster. There's a lot of different reasons, but they all kind of compile together. Flowering natives are not usually continuous bloomers. They have bloom times. Most of our flowering native <coughs> plants, the little guys and herbaceous stuff, those guys bloom for a few days to a couple of weeks at a time. Whereas if we want really nice flowers, we're looking for things like regular <coughs> impatiens or that little uh, vinca periwinkle that's gonna bloom all summer long for us to be really, really pretty. And then lack of information. Most people aren't aware of what all we have access to. So how do you utilize native plants? Get your information. Uh, most of y'all should have picked up the uh, alternatives list from uh, the Tennessee Exotic Plus Plant Control. But that is a great short list of stuff to plant this instead of that. Take and swap things out. Um, the Tenepsi website gives you lots of really great information on native plants. Picking up books like this or going and reading them at the library, even doing a search for native plants will get your information going. Pay special attention to those botanical names because that's where you can get into trouble and find some things. We have a native St. John's wort. There are lots of different types of St. John's wort. The only way to tell the difference is to get down to the botanical name. Our native St. John's wort is Hypericum frondosum. <clears throat> like I said, you will be talking Latin by the time you get done interested in native plants. Preacher, yes, ma'am. What was that website you just said? Tenepsi, uh, T N E P P C. Oh, it's, it's on, it's on the sheet. Yeah. She pointed it out. It's on here. Um, lots of good information on there. Um, again, I have a note in here about learning the botanical names. They will save you. Um, identify the places you can use native plants in your yard. Remember I talked about them very very specifically adapted to places. They will tolerate things in certain spots where the plants won't. So if you've got a hard spot in the yard, do a little research on some natives that might work for you as far as colors and whatnot, or just what conditions they'll tolerate. You'll probably find one that will work in that space a lot better. Uh, people love shoving boxwoods and Japanese hollies out along uh, sidewalks and by roads. Those plants do not take a hot Tennessee summer very well, especially with that much heat. So I always recommend they put in Yopon Holly. Those little guys, they're native to the southeast. They're swamp plants, so they're used to your soil than we even have around here. They're used to drought conditions. They're used to being flooded. They don't get really big. They have nice color to them. Much, much better option than trying for the fourth time to put a Japanese holly in there next to the road and sidewalk. Did you have a question? Um, have a place in the yard that you don't know what to do with? Convert it to natives. Swap it over. Put in a little grass prairie. Mix in some wildflowers. Just change it up. Shift some things around. Are you thinking of putting in a rain garden? Great place to start growing in tons of native plants because those guys, a lot of them are used to inundation and dry, inundation and dry, or sometimes just dry. Um, if you want something unique in your yard, go with a native plant. I can guarantee you that if you live in a neighborhood and you plant Indian pink in your yard, you're going to be the only person in your neighborhood with Indian pink in your yard, at least for a few years. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> for those
those of you asking about the website, whenever you go to the web page, you'll see this right here for all their information. Go to their landscaping tab here, and then they'll have a drop down box and all sorts of different resources you can go to. And then they have all sorts of different PDFs under those resources. They'll even talk about different days you can get their invasive lists. If you have a new invasive in your yard, you can even report it. That way they can know where it's at. This is one their big printout, uh, Landscaping with Native Plants. This is uh, Middle Tennessee, so a Central Basin specific one. They also have one that's just for Tennessee in general. So it's got a big long list of just different native plants. It's a great companion to go with the alternatives list because there's a lot of stuff on that big list that doesn't show up on there. Other excellent native plant resources. Books. So I talked about the Wildflowers of Tennessee on the Ohio Valley. You have Wildflowers of Tennessee by Jack B. Carman. You got websites. <coughs> Vanderbilt has a lot of really wonderful resources. UT Vascular Plants Herbarium. So that's a good resource. MTSU has a Cedar Glade Studies. So that's fine. Tenepsi.org, like we just talked about. Tennessee Native Plant Society. So yeah, we have our own Native Plant Society. And then, so can you dig up Native Plants? Anyone want to take a venture on that question? No, yeah, you do not want to dig up native plants. A lot of times those guys, where they're at, they may not be anywhere else. And they usually will not survive being transported. So you dig up three or four, you might get half of one. So it's much better to get them as cultivated plants, get them as plants that are grown. Pick them up from one of these nurseries or anyone else who seems a viable, reasonable, honorable resource to get them from. Remember how I said earlier, cultivated plants come in soil, it's really nice and fluffy and loose and looks like what you get the other plants out of the nursery from. If you ever go to shop for plants and you have clay soil in there or you have like weeds attached to stuff that they normally shouldn't be in a nursery pot, that's a good sign that, that plant was dug up in the wild and brought in for sale. Shun that place. <laughs> All I'd almost say run away from them because they're a breaking the law, b they're affecting the biodiversity of our native woodlands. They're just causing a bunch of awful trouble. For Grow Wild and Nashville natives, those guys give them a call ahead before you get out there. Uh, they prefer to set up appointments for whenever you come speak with them. They look at stuff, or they'll just send you a catalog of what they have available. Uh, Martin's is where I work, South Branch Nursery. Uh, we carry a lot of native cultivars there. Martin's is the only place I've been able to consistently find our co native coral honeysuckle uh, and uh, one of the more popular cultivars, John Wheeler. Mary's Greenhouse around the middle, they are a huge place, and I mean a huge place. You can go out there and get lost for about two days. Um, they're so big, in fact, that they go show up Say hello to somebody, and then just wander because we probably won't see you the rest of the day. It's a nice, great place to visit. If you want to just have a good gardening day, just go wander around, head out there. They have booths set up so you can just take and sit for a picnic because they are also out in the middle of nowhere a little bit. Where was that? Mary's Greenhouse. And that is retail, not just wholesale. Yeah. Um, native plant breakdown, they come in three varieties. Spring ephemerals, so stuff that blooms late winter, early spring. These are the guys that they come up, they leaf, they flower, they die. And that's die back, not die permanently in most cases. Herbaceous perennials, these are the guys that they'll bloom off and on, depending on variety, throughout the entire rest of the year. But some of them will bloom in spring, some will bloom in summer, some will bloom right or going into fall, some will bloom the entire time. Uh, the ones that bloom more frequently are the ones that usually get more sun, but not a lot of it. So stuff you'll find on the edges of woods. Cone flowers being an excellent example are in places where the soil is usually a little bit better. Uh, woody ornamentals, that's all the trees and shrubs. So spring ephemerals, they last a remarkably brief time. 
Like I said, they grow, they start leafing out, they flower, and then they take them back down in the dormancy. These guys, they grow in really rich soil usually. They grow inside of woodland areas. Um, one of my coworkers has been doing a for fun project over at Barfield Park where she's went through the last two years and documented as many as she can of all the wildflowers that come up in those woods in the spring. And she's working on getting them put together so they have that up there as a resource at the wilderness station. Um, their whole purpose in life is to get up and get done before the leaves get on the trees. So they're fast. You literally can miss their bloom time if you're a day off. That's how quick they flower out and they're finished. A lot of these guys are niche plants for a home use because they're really truly specimen plants. Like you have them in the yard, you know where he is, and you'll go out there every day and you go, how are you doing? <laughs> And you'll just wait. And then one day he'll flower, <coughs> might flower for two days, and then, and then it's like, where'd it go? Was, did the rabbits get it? And it's gone until the next spring whenever it comes back up again. They usually have really fleshy root systems that hold a lot of moisture, that hold a lot of energy. Um, they're really, really tough plants. They're beautiful little flowers. This is a little anemone right here. Um, flower, following seed production, they will re-enter dormancy. So as soon as they get everything situated for the next generation, they're done. Lots of wonderful spring ephemerals. Um, Virginia bluebell is here. Notice that it has lots of leaf litter. It's near a creek, and it's in the woods. It's got a pretty fleshy leaf. You may see that foliage through the first part of the summer. By the middle of the summer, they should most likely be dived back down to the ground. You can see that they're getting plenty of good access to water. They've got lots of good nutrient material. So again, just really, really good. Another little fun spring ephemeral. Trilliums, all sorts of different kinds of these guys. This is a nice little short list. You may notice the hen bit on there. Yes, that is a native wildflower. It's not just a weed. Um, Bluebells, Spring Beauty, Two Fork, Anemones. Jacob Ladder is a beautiful plant. Make sure you're checking the botanical name on that because there are several different ones from other places in the world. Daffodil is a spring ephemeral. Go figure. Comes up, flowers in spring, they're done. Um, herbaceous natives, these are the guys that get the fleshy growth to them. They kind of stay standing the whole year, even though they not, may not be flowering. Uh, they've got a pretty good lifespan. A lot of them are biannual plants where they'll flat, put on foliage the first year. Next year they bloom, put out the seed, and then usually the root mass dies and the new seeds put out new plants. Um, as we keep cultivating them, we, we attempt to migrate their evolution towards where they're true perennial plants. So they keep coming back off the same rootstock. But it's very important whenever you're getting a hold of native cold bars to pay attention to exactly how they carry on their existence. Because you may have something there thinking it's gonna come back for the next 10 to 15 years. That's only if it can reseed. And a lot of these guys depend on not being overly burdened with soil or mulch before they come up again the next year to actually be able to come back up from the seeds. Um, lots of different environments. You've got shade, you've got sun, you've got water, you've got creek sides, you've got big open fields, you've got cedar glades where they're growing on three inches of soil on a flat rock. Um, lots of different flowers. Uh, this right here is our native delphinium, found in a wooded area. They do well that way. You'll find some delphiniums at nurseries usually, not as tolerant to the humidity, they will melt. Uh, Joe Pieweed, cone flower. Uh, like I said, they'll bloom off and on all summer, depending on cold bar. Richard? Yes, ma'am. Joe Pieweed is fantastic if you want to attract uh, butterflies. <clears throat> it's a great butterfly. And it gets plant. very, if you're not familiar with it, it gets very, very tall. And, but mm -hmm. it, yes, I planted mine down the ground with a deck that's up high. 
And so, you know, this much of the top comes up above the deck and the rest, and it just the leaves is down mm -hmm. below and the butterflies just love it. They will swarm that sucker. And it doesn't mind being in spots that get a lot of water. It doesn't mind being in a spot that gets dry frequently. And which one is that? Joe Pye. That's this guy right here. I have another picture of him later in the slot slide. I actually put mine where the air conditioner water comes out and I put a piece of hose on it. I put it in the spider wars there that both like wetness and that water then helps water them. And the other good side about that is that seasonal wetness. So then it dries out in the winter and it doesn't hold a lot of water so that doesn't cause any chance for the roots to rot out. That's always something to watch on because a lot of the stuff that's used to dry wetter conditions during the winter during the summer, may not enjoy it during the winter. Uh, a good short list, I mentioned a lot of these so far. Tennessee coneflower, Indian paint, uh, heuchera, butterfly weed, uh, also known as milkweed. There's uh, three different varieties of that. We got some swamp milkweed <coughs> and some of the orange milkweed out there in the butterfly garden. Uh, Joe Pye weed, cinnamon and fern. We have two really awesome ferns native to Tennessee. One is cinnamon, the other one is royal purple. Both of them can tolerate about four to six hours of sunlight as long as it's not mid-afternoon. So, and both of them will get anywhere between here and here in height. So they're big plants. Uh, cinnamon and fern, uh, it comes up with this real long fiddle that's cinnamon colored, which hence the name. Uh, Blue false indigo, I decided to showcase this one here in the picture. Beautiful plants. Had one at the nursery last year that got five foot tall. So they can get big. Uh, the flowers are really pretty. The seed pods that come after the flowers aren't bad to look at either. Though unless you're needing to propagate it, I would recommend cutting those off so you can get really nice upright foliage because they will take and bow the plant over as they mature. Which is great if you're trying to, you know, get them to take over an area. Not so great if you're wanting nicer, little condensed plant in the spot. Again, that whole perception and weediness thing. Uh, things you may not think about, yarrow and phlox. A lot of phlox is native to Tennessee and the southeast. Yarrows, um, you may also know them as Achilles. They kind of look like Queen's Anne lace as far as the flower layout goes. Beautiful plants. Uh, Tick seed, do not be terrified by the name. It's mostly because the seeds are very, very small seeds. The leaves on them are either very thinly thread threaded or they're a lot broader and leafier. Uh, the flowers range from anything about that big right here to about that big once all splayed out, about the size of a silver dollar. Uh, sedum, uh, these are the stone crops. There's lots of different ones of those native Tennessee. Uh, several of the ground cover ones actually work really well in the shade as a ground cover alternative. You'll find them out in the cedar blades a lot of the time. Cardinal flower, this is our native lobelia. It's a red blooming plant that gets about two foot tall. Got it's a nice little deep throat on it. Absolutely gorgeous color. It'll take full sun if it has a spot that has lots of water. Otherwise, you need to put it in the shade. Uh, woody ornamentals. So this is almost everything else. Uh, these are plants that have really strong branching to them. They are have plant structure above ground all year long. There's over 130 species of native trees found in the southern Appalachian Mountains alone. We have a lot of those guys transplanted out over here because we're close. Um, many of the trees and shrubs provide year-round interest of some sort of other, whether it be flowers, fall foliage, bark and branching structure during the winter. Um, they suit many landscaping needs. They can replace a lot of the stuff that we put in frequently. Uh, Want to do a crepe myrtle? You can instead do like a uh, sumac. That's not poison sumac, so that is native here too. That's going to be either a staghorn sumac or fragrant sumac. They got a really nice feathery leaf to them. Awesome swap out for mimosa. Don't get me started on mimosa. Um, just a good short list. I'll start off with the one I have in the picture. <coughs> this is American French tree, also known as Old Man's Beard. Also known as Pianthus virginicus, which is important because there is several other types of French tree, but they're native to Asia. 
That is an understory tree usually, so a lot like dogwoods and red buds, you'll find them in blades inside wood areas or on the outside edge or a tree line has receded over time. They don't, they do like good soil or they less like soil that drains well and has a lot of water running past it. Foliage on is beautiful in the fall. They go from reds and oranges. As you can see, lots of great flowers in the spring. They are incredibly fragrant. And the foliage is a very light um, leaf that's pretty wide, but has a really nice green with hints of a kind of a bluish texture to it. Um, other great things, everyone here should know that Tulip Poplar is a wonderful native Tennessee tree, you know, because it's our state tree. Uh, they are extremely strong. They can usually get to 80 foot in about 30 years. There are some in haulers over in Coffee County that it's 80 foot to the first branch and then they kind of go up another hundred past that because <laughs> they can get big. Uh, big leaf magnolia, y'all saw a picture of it way back earlier. It's a magnolia that's got a leaf on about that long, about that wide, and it's a deciduous magnolia. So every single year they let that leaf die decay and they put out whole new ones again the next year. If you're walking through the woods, you'll find them in one of two sizes, about yay tall or about 20 foot tall. Now you don't normally find them a lot in between because if they ever get enough light to get big, they go there fast. They put on some pretty good sized flowers, usually about that big round multi petal just like the evergreen magnolias do. Uh, Carolina Allspice, Sweet Spire, the Walmart over on Rutherford, their median right there as you're about to pull out on the Rutherford from Walmart, they have some planted all through there. Should be blooming here in about the next three to four weeks if it's not already starting. Uh, awesome alternative to planting burning bush in the yard because the leaves on it go even redder. Plus you have flowers in the spring if we have a milder winter, it'll hold on to a lot of that deep colored foliage, even through the cold. And that's which one? That's the Virginia Sweet Spire. Um, Carolina Allspice, another nice little spring blooming one. And this by no means is an exhaustive list because there's, like I said earlier, I mean, 130 different native trees and that doesn't include the woody shrubs. Um, our native Tennessee mines. Good old coral honeysuckle. <coughs> is that not just the prettiest thing you ever saw? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have passion vine, which is our native wildflower. There's some of it growing out there in the butterfly beds. If you put that into your yard, please put it into a large container near a trellis. Otherwise, it will be in the spot you planted it and about 100 yards that way and that way. Why didn't you tell me that last year? <laughs> <laughs> I kept thinking about it and go, I should have told them about that. Yeah, they'll figure yeah. it out. I was going to plant that, but David made a comment about a week ago about that. Um, if you can find an old whiskey barrel, awesome thing, because it's big enough to hold the roots and you mm -hmm. just let it go crazy from there. And you can actually see the roots starting to come out in places, so you can take them and pinch them back and prune them out. You missed the passion. Yeah. Um, Cross vine, pipe vine, which is a great nursery plant for butterflies. They go and lay their eggs and the caterpillars eat the leaves and then they pupate and make more free caterpillars. Climbing hydrangea, there is a wisteria native to America. Please, please, please plant the native wisteria. Do not destroy your house. <laughs> the Chinese wisterias, they go crazy, crazy fast and crazy strong. I know at least two trellises and arbors in town that are no longer holding up the wisteria, the wisteria is holding them up. Um, Virginia creeper, I've got down here on the last bit. It has beautiful fall color. It is great at crowding out poison ivy. Um, has a wonderful five-fingered loose leaf to it. You'll see it frequently growing near poison ivy in the wild. Lots of people confuse the two frequently. Um, but they have a really, like I said, they got five fingers, so a palmate leaf, and it's got a real heavy serration around the edge, and all of them are deeply cut to the stem of the leaf. So that's the easy way to tell the difference. And they'll grow up just as big and fast and tall, and they'll die back to the stems and every year. If you decide to put that in somewhere, put it somewhere you do not mind it growing to cover everything. 
because that sucker does something really cool in the plant world. It takes all the lime that we have in our soil and it converts it into an adhesive that it uses to attach to things. <laughs> so it'll take and it'll lay some fingers down something and it'll take and start secreting that lime and it'll make the concrete right there on whatever it's growing up. <laughs> so it's tough. Um, so you only want to grow up stuff you want it growing up. Uh, quick short list of some alternatives to plant stuff. Tree of Heaven uh, kind of reminds me a little bit of a mimosa uh, or, a, uh, honey, or a black locust or honey locust with the way the leaves are. Grows incredibly fast. We're talking 8 to 10 foot a year in some cases. I get lots of people calling to the nursery asking me about it because it's got a beautiful purple flower on it. That stuff can put out hundreds of thousands of seed a year. It will take over the place. And as fast as it grows, it will crowd up everything else in existence. I don't know of anyone in Tennessee that sells it. I'm not positive it's on the exotic uh, noxious list. If it's not, it should be. Call someone. Um, plant and said sumax especially the staghorns they grow pretty quick they don't get anywhere near as big so they're not going to take over max size on them is usually at 10 foot the leaf color in the fall is some gorgeous oranges with little shots of red in them you get some nice summer flower spikes that's what this right here is they grow on the tips the new growth in the winter and this is where staghorn comes from looks like deer antlers in velvet that's how pretty it is. And they've got all sorts of different branches growing across it. Uh, they do great in terrible soil. You'll see them growing in clumps on roadsides where nothing else is designed to live. Um, mimosa trees. Everyone's familiar with mimosa. I hate mimosa. I had one mimosa, a mimosa in the backyard. That thing was a giant pain in the butt. I much prefer red buds. Much nicer plant. One of the first native trees to bloom in the spring. And you can usually expect a cold chill within about a week of them flowering. Because they flower early enough that you know you're going to get another one, but they're a good cue as it's gotten warm enough to kill off some stuff, so now it's going to get cold. Um, mature size, if they get that big, is about 30 foot tall and wide, so they can make a large tree eventually. Once they get about 15 a foot, they tend to slow down considerably in the growth. Bradford pear, we don't sell a Bradford pear at the nursery. If we sold a Bradford pear at the nursery, I probably would have worked at the nursery. Um, that tree is great for one thing, one thing only. For all, I prefer to say making firewood. Making <laughs> firewood. Uh, it's a shame it's such a pretty tree. Yeah, it's got good structure to it. They do have an improved variety called Cleveland, but it still has a lot of issues with being able to get out and spread around. You'll find those guys growing all over the county, out in fields and whatnot, because even though they should be sterile, they're not. And then once those babies get out and you get the first new one off of it, it just goes crazy afterwards. Um, much preferable to plant dogwood out, or even that uh, American fringe tree. Much prettier trees, much nicer trees, and we need to give dogwoods as much help as we can because if we can keep the population up and healthy, we can at least kind of carry it over until this anthracnose either runs its course or we can get a healthy population that is resilient to it. Does the anthracnose only affect the corn of Florida or is it all of them? On that, I'm not terribly sure. I know it does a big hit to corn of Florida. I don't know if it affects the Chinese dogwoods. I haven't heard anything about it being a real problem on any of the twig dogwoods or the shrub dogwoods, but again, I'm not overly familiar with anything beyond uh, finding it in the tree. Um, burning bush, Euonymus ablata, nice plant. That's the dwarf cultivar, by the way, that gets six to eight foot tall. The regular stuff will get over 12. Much better option. Hearts of Bustin, also known as Strawberry Bush. This is our native Uonima shrub. It's also deciduous. We have some of this planted behind the shed over here at the uh, demo gardens. Beautiful plant, especially when it gets to this stage. Foliage is nice. Has some good bark. Has some good branch until it once it gets older. Yes, sir. Uh, fall color is going to be just as pretty as on the burning bush. Going to be all those nice reds. Plus, you also have the fruit. So, 
Don't eat this, by the way. <laughs> birds eat it? Birds will eat it, yes. Uh, don't let people or kids eat it. Uh, it takes quite a bit of it to make the tummy sick, but it'll make the tummy sick. How big do they get? Um, if I remember right, they don't get more than, I think, six foot. Okay. And, and, and I've got some of the burning bushes on one side of my house. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's the downside to those? The danger? They take and they do reseed and get out into the woods. They are an incredibly durable plant, which is why a lot of people plant them. I've seen those guys be pulled out of the ground, thrown on top of dirt piles, and root back into the soil. That's how tough they are. Um, they'll even make little colonies eventually in spots. They get very dense, especially they have repeated kill across the top, which makes it hard for things to move through them. It's easier, in my opinion, to move through a thicket of mountain laurel than it is to move through a thicket of burning bush. Because at least the mountain laurel, you can find spots to wiggle. You're not going to find anywhere to wiggle without breaking things in burning bush. So you have to actually be able to mechanically destroy stuff as you're moving through big bits of it. So it limits the amount of cover that other mammals can get. And it just starts taking over and competing in the woods. And that's really the big thing. Um, usually when we're talking in bases, we're talking anything that's going to get out of the yard and into the environment and start competing with other plants. Uh, so that's why it winds up on this list. It's not the worst offender by far. Um, they are fairly manageable as long as you keep the seed off of it and you kind of prune it a little bit late in the year. But if you have an option and you don't mind planting an alternative, it's always better to plant an alternative. So they're not bad, they're just, they're one of those things that there's a potential for a problem. Um, kind of like Nandina many years ago, we started cropping up in front of us. Um, Chinese privet, we talked about that a second a little bit ago. Uh, much better to plant our native Osmanthus, this devil wood. Um, that's it. the uh, American French tree would be a good swap out for that. None of the little leaf deciduous privets are allowed to be sold in Tennessee anymore. They are all on the noxious list. You cannot sell them. You cannot transport them. And if you're digging them up, you're going to be digging them up to kill them. And how big does that get, the Osmanthus? Um, let's see. If there are other cultivars or any estimation i'm going to say probably between four and eight foot somewhere in that range okay. they're usually not very big plants um both of them are going to have very similar fruit going to have wonderful flowers they're going to be evergreen uh, to semi evergreen one is not going to take you and get into your neighbors your next neighbors and two and a half houses down and take over the yard. <clears throat> um, honeysuckle, we'll talk about that. Um, love these guys. There's lots of different cultivars, the Sempervirens, and there's even some hybrid crosses with the European honeysuckles that aren't as invasive, but are also really pretty. I've got the major wheeler. Now, what about gold flame? Is that invasive? Gold flame is one of those European hybrids. Is it? It's not invasive that I know of. Um, there, so I've got the red, I'd like a different mm -hmm. color. Um, the growth on it that I've been able to figure out is not as strong as a good, well-situated coral honeysuckle. Okay. So it seems to be a little bit weaker unless it's in a favored environment. So I don't perceive myself any problems with them mm -hmm. and I haven't seen listed on any, put them okay. on any lists. And the European honeysuckles I don't see on any lists. Okay. So. But then again, they're constantly updating those things, so it's something to watch for. I don't think it will be a problem, though. Um, then, questions? <clears throat> yes, another question. What if you're in a situation where you're not deciding what to plant, but you have, like, privet everywhere on your property, and you want to get rid of it and put something else in? Um, I mean, what's, what's the best approach? We've been cutting a ton of it down, but does that kill it, or do we need to... Spray, you gotta cut and spray. Yeah. Okay. Uh, immediately. They yeah. use round, spray yeah, immediately. they use a real strong roundup, mm -hmm. like at the battlefield mm -hmm. to do it. Okay. Yeah. And the best authorities to speak to on removing privet are gonna be the folks who try and get it off the battlefield. Oh, well, that's a good idea. They're constantly having to kill that stuff back. Mm. Privet has a very deep, very strong root system. So 
I like to talk to people about plants as being very resilient to pruning. Um, they remind me a lot, because I'm a nerd, of the Incredible Hulk. The more you keep punching on the Incredible Hulk, the more strong he becomes. And the tougher he hits back. Whenever you're pruning on plants, as long as the plant is healthy, the more you beat on it, the more it beats back at you. And Crivet's already really, really strong, so if you cut down one single 20-foot tall bush, <clears throat> you're probably going to wind up with a few hundred six to eight foot tall bushes. Mm -hmm. So, um, constant pruning, mm -hmm. heavy spraying and painting of what you've been putting down, and just constantly hitting it, because eventually you either will burn it out with the herbicide, or you will take and cut through its energy source. Because as long as you can get them pruned before they can put on more leaves to make more sugar, you have a fighting chance of wearing them down, but it is a very long bore of attrition. And you have to be the winner in it if you want to get rid of them. Um, be sure once you do have it backed away, any new stuff you see coming up, pull it up immediately before it gets a foothold. And I literally mean pull it up. Reach down deep by the roots and yank it out hard. Uh, get as much of that root mass out as you can. Yeah, they're easy to get out if they're small. Okay. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. And, and we've got that situation with a lot of stuff. So, you know, I'm looking through this list thinking, oh, we've got that, we've got that on the wrong column. But, <laughs> um, so, yeah. so is it just a, a gradual process to try to get rid of those and And then start introducing and, yeah, new stuff. Yeah, start introducing. It's just going to take a while. Yeah, and then after that, once you have the natives or the other things introduced in there, working to continue to keep those strong invasives like privet from being able to grab a foothold and start wiggling their way in. Um, so unfortunately it's here, it's probably here to stay until we can get everybody on board with clearing it out of their yards and that's going to be a long time if ever. Is, does clove oil have any effect on it for herbicide? I'm not familiar with clove oil unfortunately so I'm not sure. In concentrated forms, clove oil will, will burn leaves, particularly poison ivy. That's a good thing to know. Yeah. This is why I have y'all ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you buy the clove oil? Amazon. Of, okay, I've got lots of poison ivy. Yeah. yeah you know, really, you know, put, put it down. Yeah. Th this time of the year is the right time to put okay. it on. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's something to check and try and see. But it, it, will, it will burn plants. You can put it in a sprayer. A good one that sprays directly right on the plants. So you, you're not broadcasting it. Dave, you've got a lot of invasives. I definitely hit up the battlefield and talk to yeah, those folks. Yeah, that's a good idea. And it that's smells good. great. And the poison ivy. Yeah, we've got the poison ivy building. Ten foot easement so. behind my house. <laughs> They're supposed to keep it cleared. It's got a lot of privet and mm -hmm. bush honeysuckle and all that good stuff. How quickly will the sumac take over? Because I know it spreads. Um, if you give it a little extra care and attention. I have a fellow who, whenever I started working in the nursery seven years ago, bought one that was this big. It has now been to eight foot three times, and it's pushing out babies. <laughs> yes, that's just it. I, I stay back there, but I don't want it. Does it um, runners? It It's a colonizer, so the roots will push up new ones as they grow out. Uh -huh. So anywhere you don't want it to go to, at that point you can treat it kind of like bamboo. Okay. Just make a little just trench line where you don't want it to be, and anytime you see the roots coming out, cut okay. those off and make the soil where you want them to be at as healthy and hardy as you can. Mm -hmm. Speaking of bamboo, if you like bamboo, Tennessee has two and arguably three native bamboos. They're all river canes. None of them are very impressively thick canes. They're usually no more than about an inch and a half to two inches thick. But they're very nice and they're a great alternative, especially if you're wanting to have some privacy. Um, I believe the fellow at Almondville Bamboo Company has those that he grows. If you want bamboo, they're a much better alternative than any other stuff you can get. Almondville what? Bamboo Company. How deep do you have to dig the trench? Um, usually no more than about, uh, for bamboo, you want to try and get down about a foot. A foot? Yeah. Um, make it at least a foot wide so you can see those roots coming across and then you can just knock those rhizomes right off as they're coming through. 
Um, but the key to doing that trenchy method is making sure that the soil where they're at is as healthy and hardy as you can get it because I'll make them more prone to stay up so they don't dive down and then move. Because bamboos and other colony forming plants, they'll take the path of least resistance all the time. Uh, same thing happens even for uh, Bermuda grass. The better and easier it is for them to grow in that top layer of soil, or those first few inches to first foot, the more easily it is going to be to get them removed from it because they're going to stay in that top area. You can rip them out much more gently or keep them printed from the back a lot more easily. Did that answer your question? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. We left a, like a 15 foot area at the very back of our lot to, to go wild. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, ribbit is what <laughs> came up in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with this uh, devil wood, with that, it's sh it's shady for most of the day. It'll work for the shade. Uh, that's the great thing about the osmanthuses. All of them are essentially false hollies, and uh, they tend to do very well in the shade because they're not quite as sun tolerant. Uh, there's another one in the list that is uh, Leocoth. That's another good one for areas that have shade spots. That Virginia Sweet Spire I was talking about earlier is another uh, good shade plant. Uh, normally you'll find them along uh, creek and river sides, in little patches or near marshes, but in a shaded area where they're not going to be underneath quite as much stress for moisture, they do very well. Are they tight for sun? Oh yeah. Um, the more sun though they have, the more steady the water supply needs to be, at least in infrequent occurrences. That's why you'll find them a lot of times when people plant them in either spots that get really heavily inundated with water whenever it does rain, like that median over there at uh, Walmart, mm -hmm. or out in rain gardens, because that influx of moisture makes them a lot healthier, and it keeps them going strong for a while. Um, now once they get in, are they yeah, tolerant once, at all, drought tolerant at all? Oh yeah, once they get really settled into a spot, like most plants that have to grow along creek sides and riverbanks in Tennessee, water goes low, ground dries up, and they've got to wait for it to get wet again. So they've got abilities to handle getting dry. That's the great thing about swamp plants. Most of them are used to really compacted soils because whenever the ground dries out, it loses everything. So you're talking air, water, all of it. And then they're used to being flooded and just being dry just infrequent intervals. Anybody else? A few years ago, there was a, I think she was an MTSU professor. Uh, she came out to my place and she was helping identify native and non-native, mm -hmm. possibly <coughs> her company extension too. Does this sound familiar at all? Um, she, we usually have folks go out, right, Farmer? I didn't hear what he said. Um, he had a lady from MTSU come out a few years ago and identify uh, some native and non-native plants in his yard. Is there anybody on staff at Extension that does that currently? Uh, I mean, we have people that, that do horticulture. I don't know how well-versed they are in the native and non-native. I know they know some about it. Uh, they might be able to pull someone in from the regional or state level to, to do that. Yeah. It'd definitely be a resource to tap. I mean, they're here for that purpose. Right. Check, so. check with uh, Mitchell Moat. Um, and uh, yeah. he's he's our plant guy, that, and that's the one I called, and I think I think through him possibly got to her. Okay, I mean a lot of us, just like Richard, have a lot of information that is not from us taking classes. It's just like all of you from just experience, you know. Uh, but if you want something to officially come out that, that has the knowledge, yeah, he can probably help. Which is helpful because she yeah. was able to identify some things well, that I wasn't sure about. And there's a lot of stuff that looks really similar. There is a native bush honeysuckle to Tennessee. Yeah. Right. It looks ridiculously similar to the invasive one. That's what she was helping with. Um, uh, David Adams might. Would he, David Adams? Yeah. He might be a battleground. Yeah. Who does the rain gardens? Who's the. Over at MTSU? Um, I know for a long time that uh, Warren Anderson Warren was Anderson. of those. Yeah. He, he also did some help in looking at some possible rain guards around my place. Yeah. 
Is he no longer? Um, I believe he still teaches, though. I think he's working on trying to retire. <laughs> There may be some graduate students over there that would be willing to come out. So if you contact some of them, some of those graduate students might appreciate the opportunity to go yeah. out. They've got a really, really active agri science department over there for everything that's cousin to do with plants. So they're a good resource to tap, and we're fortunate to have them here. That's free. Yep. And a lot of them, they're taking those degrees, not because they intend to make a ton of money with them, but because it is something they enjoy doing. I've got a gal that worked at the nursery with us a couple of years ago. She's now up in Alaska doing some forestry projects.